Good morning, and welcome to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, Mandarin Baptist Church. This is his church, and we welcome you via live stream where we can worship together uh, all around our community and around the globe. Would you join with me now as we pray and ask for God's blessing uh, on this hour? God, we are grateful for this day, for this is the day that you have made. We thank you, Lord, that you have blessed us in so many ways. We thank you, Father, that we can gather uh, through technology and we can raise our voices to you and praise and worship you together. God, thank you for what you have for us to hear today through your message. Thank you that you have a vital message an important message for us to know, to learn, and to apply to our lives. We ask for your blessing, Lord, on this hour as we bring our worship to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now let's praise the Lord together and worship in song. Would you join together?
so grateful for who you are and the fact that you are big enough and strong enough and loving enough to meet us where we are. And so, God, I just pray in this time, uh, Lord, of, of trial and testing and frustration and confusion, God, I just pray for your perspective. I pray that your love would be at the forefront of our minds and everything we do as we adjust to this new season, as we figure out things about ourselves, God, would it point us to your love? Would it guide us into who you are and into your presence? So Lord, we take just a few moments to focus on you and to worship you in this time. Good. 
first night You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness of God and all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness of God Father, we are grateful that we have an opportunity to give back to you just a portion of what you've blessed us with. We bring our tithes and our offerings, not because we have to, but because we want to. And I thank you, Lord, that you have assembled a, a group of believers who are passionate about their walk with you and that they give Cheerfully, they give because they love you. Lord, thank you that even in the midst of this pandemic, this altered lifestyle that we all are living, that our people are faithful in giving. Bless them, Lord. Bless their efforts. And Lord, may you make us wise on how to spend the funds that are collected, that it would be used for your kingdom and to build your kingdom, to further your kingdom. And Father, now as we dig into the word of God, I pray, Lord, that you would bless our time studying. Lord, that it would not just be inspirational, but it would be life-changing. We commit this hour to you in Jesus' name. Amen. If I were to ask you what you think is the most talked about subject in the Bible besides God. If you go to Google, you will get a, a, a bit of a controversy. And there, there is, uh, there's some that would say that love is the most talked about subject in the Bible. Others would say that. Money is the most talked about subject in the Bible. 
Whichever is true, we know that both love and money is talked about quite often in the Bible. Now we get to love part because God is love. And he's the author of love. He's the sustainer of love. And he's the source of love. But money, on the other hand, is a, is a bit of a, a different story. But why would God talk so much about money, almost as much or maybe more about money than he talked about love? Well, I think part of that is because God knows just how easily, how often, and how quickly we can be entangled in money. As you know, we uh, have for the last two weeks have been on the series of stewardship. We talked about our time and how we're created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Ephesians 2 taught us that. And then last week we talked about our talents and how we're gifted. We are talent, uh, talented, uh, gifted to expand God's kingdom. We found that out in Matthew 25. And today, I want to talk to you about our treasure. So what are we instructed to do in Scripture regarding our possessions, our money? My aim for this sermon is to, to give sound biblical guides so that you can walk in freedom and not in bondage regarding money. Money can master you. That's why it's talked about so often in the Bible. And we don't want money to master us, but we want to master it. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Now, we've probably heard that verse and familiar with that part of the verse, but not many of us are too familiar with the second half of that verse. And it says, it is through this craving or this striving for money, this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs, uh, another word for suffering. So to sum that up, to, to lo the love of money can drive a person away from their faith. And the love of money can cause us all kinds of pain and suffering. But just as God has a plan and a purpose for salvation and everything else in life, he has a plan and a purpose for money. And that's why I've titled this sermon today, The Heart of Giving. Now, since my first days as a Christian, I decided that I would be uh, a tither. I'm not sure why. Uh, everybody I knew was a, was a tither of the people that I looked up to, tithe. And so I became a tither. And I'll tell you, it was easy for me initially the reason it was so easily easy is because when you don't have a lot of money, 10% is just not a big deal. I mean, if you have $10 in your pocket, what's a dollar? You still have $9. But the more money that I made, the more income that I had, I have to admit to you that I'd be lying if, if I said that it, it, it didn't make it harder. You see, when that 10% begins to creep up uh, over the, the three digits, you start thinking about all kinds of things that you can do with that money. A dollar, not so much. But when your tithe becomes $100 or $200, which is 10% of your income, then all of a sudden it becomes a big temptation. Our faith is often challenged by the world that says we need money to survive. But do we? 
Do we need money to survive, or is it more appropriate to say we need God to survive, and that God sometimes uses money as a vehicle? God's principle in the economy does not and will not make sense to the earthly-minded person. It just does not make sense. The Christian's understanding God's purpose for money begins with the issue of tithing. In God's economy, tithing is where we must start. So let's take a look at the scriptures to see and maybe glean some knowledge so that we can be better informed, walk in obedience, and stand in direct line of God's blessing. So we're going to be bouncing around today uh, in the Old Testament and the New Testament. The first thing, the first question I think we need to answer is, what is a tithe? The word tithe, uh, it just simply means one-tenth. Tithe is, is, is simply a ten percent. Tithing is an Old Testament principle. It must be the first fruits, off the top, before anything else. Exodus twenty three nineteen says, The best of the first fruits of your ground you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. A people often ask, is tithing a New Testament principle. And I have heard people speak on this and teach on this, uh, and you can have uh, different opinions. So we know that tithing is mentioned in the Old Testament, but is, is it apl applicable to the New Testament church? Well, actually, tithing is mentioned in both the Old and New Testament, but it actually predates the Mosaic law. Genesis chapter 14, and uh, the writer of Hebrews also recounts this in Hebrews chapter 7, but it says this, Abram, now that's before God changed his name to Abraham in chapter 17, Abram gave a tenth of the spoils to Melchizedek, king of Salem. Who was this king? Uh, Melchizedek is a compound word, Melech, uh, and added to Sadiq. So Melech means king, and Sadiq means righteousness. So this, his name literally means a righteous king. He was the king of Salem. What is Salem? Salem is really Shalem, and it means peace peaceful. Ironically enough, it was the early name uh, for Jerusalem. Now, the writer of Hebrews compares Melchizedek to none other than Christ himself. A question is often asked, do I tithe from my gross income or my net Income. Well, that's between you and God. And I would urge you and encourage you to ask him. And let him reveal the answer to you. Let him reveal your heart, even in why you ask that question. I can tell you this, that I started out tithing from my net income, but now I tithe, just gradually moved over to where I tithe on my gross income. 
And here's just my personal experience. Now, I'm not saying that this is how it's going to be with everybody. I'm just saying, I'm just telling you how I experience this tithing from net income to gross income. Almost all of my life, I tithe on my net income, and yet I seem to always remain some, somewhat, somehow uh, in debt. There was always some debt. But several years ago, as we began to tithe on our gross income, it seems, though, that we had more to spend. I can't explain that to you. But what I can tell you that since we began to tithe on our gross income more and more, we are now on the brink of being debt free. Here's a statistic that year after year, only about 20% of evangelicals tithe. And so if you're debating whether to tithe on the net or the gross, just start somewhere. Start somewhere. Another question that may be asked is, what's the difference between a tithe and an, and an offering? When we uh, collect the offering uh, at church, we call, we call it an offering. We pray and we pray for the tithes and the offering. But what's the difference between a tithe and an offering? Well, a tithe is off the top and it's before anything else. It's, it's the 10% that's the, of, the, of your income that's off the top. An offering, on the other hand, is over and above the 10% and whatever you choose to give to the Lord. Malachi 3.10 says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse, which is another word for treasury. And in, today, in today's standards, today's uh, interpretation of that would be that it's the local church. It's the, it's, the local church is the representation of the Old Testament storehouse. Now, why... Why does God say in Malachi to bring the full tithe into the storehouse? It's really to, it's, it helps us test our faith. When we give off the top before we even calculate what we need for the rest, what we're saying is that we trust God. So before you calculate uh, what you need until the next pay period, you, take, you first take that 10%, you give that to the Lord, and then you figure out what you do with the other 90%. Now God himself in this very verse says he wants you to test him. Look at the second part of that verse. He says, Put me to the test. Now, an offering is, in a monetary sense, we know that there are other ways of bringing an offering. A, an offering of praise, a, a sacrifice of praise, an offering of time, an offering of talent. But here, strictly, we're talking about an offering, which is a monetary offering. It's from the surplus you give out of your abundance tithe is first and foremost off the top but then an offering then is what you give out of your surplus out of your abundance just a word of caution a word of advice for you is to give your tithe off the top then take care of your family meet your family's needs you should do that before investing in ministry. 
Dave Ramsey says that you can't be behind on your rent payment and be current with the local ministry. I've seen this oftentimes. People get caught up in uh, if they give to this ministry, God will bless them. They hear that and they buy into it. And so instead of paying for what they need, they invest in that ministry and be late for the, on their rent or even forego buying food and medicine. God wants you to tithe and then he wants you to take care of your family and yourself and your needs and then out of the abundance or the surplus bless others with your offering. It was uh, Charles Stanley that says America now this is a 1995 statistics I read it in one of his one of his books American evangelicals have $850 billion in disposable income. $850 billion with the B. That's a lot of disposable income. If you took one-fifth of 1% one of that, one-fifth of 1%, one not even a, a percent, but a fifth of 1%. That could fund the starting of 12,000 new churches every year. Now I want to stop right here and say that tithing is, is not a salvation issue. You don't tithe to be saved. It's not a salvation issue. But it is an obedience issue. And it is a trust issue. God wants you to trust him. God wants you to test him. And I might say, and this is just sort of my paraphrasing it, that he's itching to bless you. Look again in verse 10. He says, put me to the test if if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Now, let me just stop and ask you here. How big do you think that window is? We're not talking about a little tiny window in a powder room somewhere. We're talking about heaven's window. Another translation for this word is floodgates, that God would open up the floodgates. We're not talking about a tiny little window here. This is God talking, and so this is a God-sized window, multiple windows. When he says that he is going to pour down for you, the word pour means empty out. It doesn't mean just a little bit of what he has, but it means that he is going to pour it out, empty it out on you. He says for you, and that's singular, it's not plural, for you, he says that twice. That means it's individual, it's for you, it's a blessing for you. And then he adds that it's until there is no more need. Where you get to the point where you say, okay, God, I can't handle anymore. Turn it off. So when you read that, why is it so hard to trust God then? When he makes such a promise. I think we can come up with a myriad of excuses. But none of them would be valid. I think the bottom line for most of us is that we want to hold on to what we have. Because we think it's ours. 
And I don't know about you, but for me, when I think that way, it's because I have too much of the world's influence in my life. I remember some years ago when Donna and I first got married and we were dirt poor and uh, we were looking for any opportunity to to score some tickets to Disney World. You know, it's kind of hard when you live so close and yet you can't go. And we found this timeshare sort of sales office and we heard from friends that all you had to do was to go and sit for an hour at this timeshare sales pitch and they gave you two tickets to Disney World. Well, we wanted to go to Disney World and we thought, what's an hour? We can kill an hour and just sit and listen. And we we watched this video and then we were ushered into a sales office where they sit down and give you the sales pitch. And and I remember at the time my my salary was fourteen thousand dollars a year. It wasn't a whole lot, even in those days. And I remember the this, this salesman saying, okay, let, let's go through your income. And because he says, I want to prove to you that you can afford this timeshare. So we went through all of the things that we spend our money on. And the first thing on the list was our tithe. And he says, what's that? I said, well, that's what we give to the Lord. That's what we give to our church. And I sat there and and just really started fuming because he began to tell me, even called the sales manager over and began to gang up on us and tell us that God wanted us to have this timeshare and that we should... reallocate our resources from the tithe to our timeshare because God wants us to enjoy life. The world can't understand God's financial plan. The world doesn't get why we give to Him. The world says it's yours. You earned it. You deserve it. Do with it as you please. But the true believer, the Christian understands that every breath we take, every skill, every gift, every talent, every ability comes from God. Not to do as we please, but to bring honor and glory to his name. God doesn't exist for us. We exist for Him. God's financial plan says, blessings come through giving. In Luke chapter 6, verse 38, it says, Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, and it will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Notice all the verbs in this verse describing what God does before handing the blessing to you. Press down. Shaken together, running over, and put into your lap. You imagine this. I remember when I was growing up and living in Japan, and my mom, I mean, every night we we cooked rice. It just was a staple. It's what we had. And she would ask me to make rice, and I would take the, the cup, the measuring cup, and I would pack the rice in as much as I could. I would shake it. I would pack it. I would pat it down. And she would tell me, don't do that. Because she said, if you do that, then that measuring cup will have too much in it. Because the cup and the measurement of that cup is not designed to be packed in. And so if you put too much in there, if you pack it in, 
you're not going to have the right amount. And that's what God wants to do with blessing us. He calls it good measure. He presses it down. We're not talking about a Frito-Lay potato chip where the bag is this big, but when you open it up, two-thirds of it is air and there's just a few chips in there. He's talking about packing it in. It's pressed down. It's shaken together. And then on top of that, it's running over. And then he places that blessing in your lap. That's what God says he will do for you. Well, there's a story about a retired couple. And they were excited about going on a little trip. And so they packed the car and all they had to do the next morning was get up, get dressed, grab the cat and off they would go. So the morning came and the husband went outside to call the cat. And to his dismay. He found the cat way up in a tree. He called and called and called that cat to come down. But it would not budge. His wife was hollering from the front door, hurry up and grab that cat. But she was anxious to get on the road. Suddenly, he had a good idea. He ran into the garage and he got a rope and a ladder. Then he placed a ladder up against the tree and he climbed as high as he could. And he reached up as higher, uh, high as he could, higher still. And he tied one end of the rope to the tree. Then he climbed back down and he tied the other end of the rope to the bumper of his car. He got in it, started the car and slowly and gently began to pull the tree over. It was a young enough tree that it bent rather nicely. His plan was working. And he got that tree bent down enough where he thought that he can now reach the cat. So he put it in park and he walked around back. And sure enough, the cat was still clinging to the tree. He reached up and he was just about to have the cat in his hand. And then, snap, the rope broke. And immediately that tree went back to being straight and as a, uh, acted as a catapult. And all he could see was this cat just flying through the air. Well, he and his wife, Distraught, they went up and down, up and down, up and down the streets trying to find their cat to no avail. Disappointed, heartbroken, they decided to cancel their trip. And the wife said, you know, I need to go to the store now and get some groceries since we're not leaving. So she went to the grocery store and as she was at the checkout line, she ran into a friend who lived about three blocks away. She hadn't seen in a while. They explained, uh, uh, exchanged uh, pleasantries. And then the woman, the neighbor said, you will never guess what happened to us today. You see, we've been praying what to get. We just didn't know what to get for our little son Johnny for his birthday. And, and today we were sitting out in the backyard and out of nowhere, God made a cat to appear and it landed right in little Johnny's lap. And he so loves that cat. It's a miracle.
Well, I got to tell you, your blessing will not be coming from your neighbor's mishaps. Your blessing will be coming directly from God himself. It's going to be poured out from the windows, from the floodgates of heaven. He's going to open up the window of heaven and rain down a good measure. Press down, shaken together to maximize the load. And it'll be running over. And he's going to drop it right in your lap. And then he says, the more you give, the more I'm going to pour into your lap. Now, please don't misunderstand this. This is not a, a get rich prosperity gospel that I'm preaching. I, and I'm not talking about necessarily that if you give a dollar, he's going to give you ten dollars. But what I am saying to you is that what God wants to bless you with is is more than what money can buy. What God wants to bless you with, you can't put a price on it. Sometimes it's money. Sometimes it's possessions. But most oftentimes it's things that cannot be bought with a silver or a gold coin. Now, this is what God says. This is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 9. He says, the point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. And then Paul gives us some direction in giving in the following verse. He says this, each one must give as he has decided in his heart. It's not really the amount that Paul is uh, bringing our attention to, but more so Paul is, is wanting to make sure that we're giving out of our heart because we want to, not because we feel a duty to or coerced to. Giving is first and foremost about the heart. Following in that verse, he says, not reluctantly or under compulsion, not out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. The word cheerful there is where we get the word hilarious. He wants us to give hilariously, cheerfully, with gladness in our hearts. Knowing that we can't outgive him, knowing that what we do for him brings honor and glory to him. In closing, giving affords us the opportunity to trust God. When we give to God, we are trusting him. We're not trusting in our own ability or our bank account, our possessions. Giving allows us to be a part of what he is doing. We get to invest with him. God doesn't need our money. But God does want our participation in building his kingdom. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the challenge of giving. Thank you for your, your word that teaches us to give. 
that gives us instructions on how to give and what mindset and what heart to have when giving. And I pray, Lord, that that's a challenge for all of us that, Lord, thank you for the ones who do give and they, get, they give cheerfully. They've been doing it for many years. There are others, Lord, that it's a challenge for them. I pray, Lord, that starting today, that you would bless them with the ability, the mindset, and the eagerness, the gladness, and wanting to give. Lord, I think about the, the many things that you want this church to accomplish. It's that you want us to do more than just paying the salaries of pastors and keeping the lights on. That you, you want us to do some incredible outreach in this community. And Lord, we know that you can do all of that without money. But we also know, Lord, that you choose our giving our tithes and our offerings as a vehicle. Lord, find us faithful in giving. And teach us to trust you more. And trust ourselves less. In Jesus' name, amen. I do hope that you have had an opportunity before the service to prepare the elements for the Lord's table. It's our joy and honor to partake of this, this table together. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and the cup and he asked his disciples in taking the bread and the cup to remember him and what he was about to do and I'm sure that there was a great confusion among the disciples of what exactly he was talking about even 2,000 years later in recorded history in the scriptures that we have we can't make complete and total sense of it but what we do know is that on that night he became the ultimate sacrifice and he hung on the cross and he paid the penalty of our sins and Jesus said to remember him we're so prone to forget aren't we We need to periodically remind ourselves and to remember what he did for us. And so that's why we take this bread and then we take this cup as a reminder. And again, to say thank you. First, he took the bread. He blessed it and he said, this is my body which is given for you, take and eat. On that same night, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood, which is shed for you. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Someone had to pay. And that someone was Jesus. Jesus shed his blood to pay for the penalty of our sin. He says, do this in remembrance of me. Take and drink.
Father, thank you for sending your son. Thank you for this marvelous plan of redemption. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but to have e eternal life. It's all made possible because of what Jesus did on the cross. Thank you, Lord Jesus. For paying for our sins. Thank you for redeeming us with your blood. Lord, we confess to you that we're prone to forget. And so thank you that you have instituted this table that we can be reminded once again of your sacrifice. I pray, Lord, for all in our congregation and all believers around the world, your church, the body of Christ, that the way we live would be a reflection of our gratitude. And just how thankful we are that you provided the way of escape so that instead of death, we have life. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, beloved, I want to encourage you to walk by faith and not by sight. I want to encourage you to pray for the day that we will be able to gather again and celebrate the Lord Jesus and reunite. But in the meantime, I want you to be encouraged in your faith and to know that in spite of your circumstances, God has a mission for you. In fact, in your circumstances, God has specific missions for you. I don't know what that is, but ask God and let him reveal to you what he wants you to do how he wants you to minister to other people. Because he loves you, he made a way for you. Because he loves you, you can go love others. God bless you. We'll see you next week.